Good morning, my dear friends up there in Canada. Uh, good to see you again this morning. Hope you're doing well. We've been studying the end time events, what we call eschatology or the study of last things, and we've come to the second coming of Christ. This has been a crazy year, this year, uh, 2020, uh, with the pandemic, uh, with uh, the social unrest, uh, with the economy harmed, uh, with the drama regarding the election. Uh, there are so many reasons why you may be saying to yourselves, I'm longing for the return of Christ. We previously covered uh, the return that takes us to be with Jesus Christ uh, just before uh, the tribulation uh, here on earth. That's the rapture that occurs uh, seven years prior uh, to the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation. And so uh, the second coming itself uh, had to occur because when Jesus came the first time, uh, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Uh, so he began to explain he would have to come again. And in the meantime, uh, we're in this uh, church age awaiting uh, the fulfillment of prophecies, especially uh, the prophecy regarding Israel repenting and turning to Jesus Christ and crying out to him as the promised Messiah. That's what will bring Jesus Christ back to this earth to set up his kingdom and to rule for a thousand years. We'll be a part of that as believers here in this church age. Uh, one of our rewards is that we will rule and reign with Christ here on this earth uh, for a thousand years. The second coming is found in many passages uh, in the scripture. Uh, let's first talk about the timing of it. Uh, you are perhaps wondering, like, uh, what are the signs of the times? How can I tell uh, if it's getting closer? It seems like it's been a very long time, uh, 2,000 years, so why hasn't he come yet? Well, Jesus actually speaks to this issue uh, regarding awaiting the repentance of Israel and the acceptance of him as Messiah. In Matthew chapter 23, beginning with verse 37, uh, he in a sense, wails over the fact that Israel will not receive him as their king. Matthew 23, 37 says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, until you repent and you want me to rescue you as your promised Messiah. What's happened is, the nation of Israel has closed its heart against Jesus Christ. And so many of the events that are occurring on the earth during this time, during this church age, for example, are meant to push Israel to re-examine their rejection of the Messiah and eventually repent and accept him. We read in Romans chapter 11, beginning with verse 25, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, what a mystery is in this case is something that has not been revealed clearly before. So that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. I want you to notice that God is involved in allowing Israel to harden its heart against the promised Messiah. But notice this is not settled and it is not complete. Paul describes it in Romans as a partial hardening. And then the last phrase says, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so in this age, this church age that we're in, uh, the focus is on God working with Gentiles. 
but that doesn't mean that he's forgotten about Israel. In fact, the focus is on driving Israel to the point of giving up on themselves and desiring Jesus Christ to be their promised Messiah and their King. What we're living in right now is we're watching a secular Israel. Uh, the Israel that has occupied uh, the ancient lands is not the return of Israel that has been prophesied in the Millennial Kingdom. It is not uh, a group of Jews who have received Jesus Christ as King and as Messiah. We are still in this age of Israel hardening itself. It will not finish until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, meaning that God is done working with the Gentiles. Then he prophesies in Romans 11.26, and so all Israel will be saved. It's true that some Jews are believing in Jesus Christ. We know of Messianic Jews, for example. But the prophecy is the nation as a whole will return to believe that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, the promised Messiah. And at that point, all Israel will be saved. Just as it's written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. What you see happening in Israel right now is actually a secular, uh, political uh, return to their homeland. Uh, this is not complete, and this is not spiritual. We are still awaiting the fulfillment of prophecy. But as I mentioned before, many of you, especially in 2020, are wondering, why is it taking so long? I want the Lord to return now. Uh, couldn't he return sooner? Aren't the events bad enough? Uh, Peter writes about this in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 3 and 4, where he says, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. Uh, so these are lustful mockers, mocking Christians, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And I imagine you have friends that taunt you and say, uh, you believe in Jesus Christ, you're awaiting his coming, it's been a couple thousand years, aren't you getting tired of waiting? Why, even Paul, when he writes, writes in such a way that he believes that there's nothing in the prophetic calendar that would have prevented Christ from returning in his lifetime, in the first century. And so, devout Christians have lived all of this time awaiting the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He says it is soon. He's coming soon. So why hasn't it occurred? And you might think there'd be a bad reason, actually. It's a very good reason. It's God is patient because he doesn't want to send people to hell forever. Listen to this, 2 Peter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You wonder, like, I have uh, family members who don't believe, but they know the gospel and they still haven't accepted Christ. Uh, they're ill and yet they still have not died. Why are they still alive? And the answer could possibly be, the Lord's not slow about his slowness like you might count it, but the Lord is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Every new day of life is a new opportunity for the unsaved to repent. But when he returns, the time is over. No more opportunity. Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In other words, it will come at a time that you do not expect, in a manner that you do not expect. You won't be waiting and waiting and waiting and saying, Here he comes, here he comes. He'll surprise you. Then time is up. In Matthew 
chapter 24, verse 42, uh, Jesus exhorts his listeners, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. There have been a lot of sermons, a lot of books written on predicting the return of Christ, and they have regularly proved to be wrong. Why don't we just listen and believe what he says? He says, you don't know the day that the Lord is coming. It will be a surprise. And you might say, like, well, why am I still here? If he doesn't need me, why doesn't he just rapture me and take me home to be with him? Well, he does need us. In fact, uh, he has given us very clear instructions. In Matthew 24, 14, he tells us what we're supposed to be about. We are supposed to be his ambassadors, his witnesses during this time. And that's part of the slowness, as we might view it, is that we've been rather slow in our evangelism. Matthew 24, 14 says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So, let's be about our responsibility. Uh, let's carry the gospel worldwide. Let's go to every ethnic group, every nation, every people group. And let's find them, and let's bring the gospel to them. This is our responsibility in this age. The second coming of Christ is a lot more about the nation of Israel than many of us realize, and it is a rescue. Uh, the focus is on Israel being pushed to the brink where they eventually cry out and say, I believe, I want my Messiah to come and to save me. And the second coming really is the focus of the rescue of a repentant Israel. We as the church have already been raptured seven years earlier in the rapture that takes place just before uh, the tribulation period begins. Uh, but in this tribulation, much of the purpose of it is to drive Israel to repentance because of their imminent destruction. Listen to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. You can see that wasn't the case of Israel uh, during his first coming. Uh, they were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. What's amazing about this prophecy is the way in which Jews executed their own was by stoning, in which their bones would be broken. But the prophecy was regarding the Messiah, not a bone of his body would be broken. And here in Zechariah 12.10, it even prophesies that he would be pierced. That is a hint regarding the way in which he would die in the crucifixion. But back to the point, I want you to notice that the prophecy is Israel be pushed and pushed and pushed until they mourn over what they have done. They mourn as they look on the one that they have pierced, and they weep over him and his loss and desire to have him back. In Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9, it begins to describe how they will cry out to him. Zechariah 13, 9, and I will bring the third part through fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Now, this is speaking about the terrible judgments during the tribulation period. They will call on my name, you can see this is not the case of the secular Israel that is occupying the Holy Land. Uh, that is not the return of Israel to the land, although it gives us some sense that this really could happen. They will call on my name and I will answer him, them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is 
my God. There will be uh, tremendous cataclysmic signs that cause you not to be able to miss what is taking place. This is during the tribulation period, uh, seven years into it, and in the prophecy from Jesus himself in Matthew 24, beginning with verse 29, he describes about the cataclysmic signs that you will see above the earth. He says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. So this is brought to the awareness of everybody on the whole earth because of these tremendous cataclysmic signs and their ability to understand this is it. This is the end. Uh, verse 30 says, they will see the Son of Man, that's a title of Jesus coming from Daniel, in fact his favorite title for himself, they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. That's Jesus in Matthew 24 prophesying uh, his second coming. When it happens, it will be obvious and people will recognize that it has occurred. But there was Old Testament prophecy regarding this. And the prophecy is regarding both the tribulation and his return. One of the central passages uh, regarding his second coming is found in the Old Testament, Zechariah 14. Let's read verses 1 through 9. Zechariah 14. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. This is this famous uh, battle, or more specifically, a campaign or a war uh, in the Valley of Megiddo that we call Armageddon. Uh, this is this cataclysmic battle at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. The beast uh, is going to blame the problems of the earth on Israel. And the nations will gather to fight against Israel. They'll come from the north, they'll come from the east, they'll come from the south. And like a pincer movement, they will surround Israel seeking to blame them and destroy them. And so the prophecy, clear from Old Testament times, is that all the nations will battle against Israel and Jerusalem. What happens is the city is captured, the houses are plundered, the women are ravished, half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Why? Because this is when they actually repent and they call out on him whom they have pierced. And Zechariah 14.3 says, The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. At the rapture, Jesus Christ returns just to the clouds, and he calls us up to join him in the clouds, and then he immediately goes back into heaven and takes us into safety in heaven during the seven-year period of the outpouring of God's wrath on the earth dwellers and the motivating of Israel to repent. But in his actual second coming, he lands on the earth. In his second coming, the prophecy is he'll land on the Mount of Olives, Israel is trapped and needs a way of escape. He will touch down on the actual Mount of Olives and it will split in two and provide a way of escape. Listen to Zechariah 14 verse 4. This is the second coming. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, 
and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half towards the south. This is to provide the way of escape. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. So we are returning with him. In that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And this is where Jesus actually takes over Jerusalem and sets up uh, a judgment and then establishes his thousand-year reign here on earth, which we call the millennium. Verse 8, In that day living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, the other half towards the western sea. It will be summer as well as in winter. And here is the declaration of his rule. Zechariah 14, verse 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one, in his name the only one. Much of Christendom today uh, thinks that we're already in a millennial kingdom uh, that is not physical, not earthly, not political, but is the rule of Christ in men's hearts. And so as I submit myself to Christ and he rules in my heart, I have the effects of the millennial reign in my heart. As you can see from all of these prophecies, these are meant to be physical, political, cataclysmic, real events. And we are saying that this is still future, as you can read these prophecies. The second of the central passages regarding the return of Christ to earth to set up his thousand-year reign is found in Revelation chapter 19 beginning with verse 11. So Zechariah 14, Revelation 19 are the two major passages regarding the second coming. Revelation 19 verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so the second coming of Christ is not to rescue the church and take us to be with them in heaven to protect us uh, from the outpouring of God's wrath during the tribulation period. It's actually a rescue of a repentant Israel and the setting up of his thousand-year reign over them. And we, uh, with resurrected bodies, uh, will rule and reign over these Jews who have survived the tribulation period and are now with natural bodies ready to enter into uh, this perfect rule here on earth. Revelation 19, verse 17 says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he called out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. 
And so you see that there's tremendous destruction through this terrible war of the Battle of Armageddon. And you can see that so many people are wiped out. They came in the millions trying to destroy Israel. But Jesus Christ comes just in time uh, to rescue them. And he judges. He judges uh, those uh, there who have also survived the tribulation period. He judges the Antichrist. He judges uh, the false prophet. Uh, listen to verse 19, Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. The lake of fire is the ultimate final place of separation from God himself for eternity in which Satan will be cast. Uh, but the first two occupants are uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're cast alive. Notice this is not uh, just uh, some sort of imagery. This is real. And the unbelievers uh, of this age that are now in Hades will spend a thousand years longer in Hades, and then they will be raised to be judged before the great white throne judgment and finding that they have not believed in Jesus Christ and have not uh, lived in a manner that was pleasing to Christ will join uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet uh, in the lake of fire. Verse 21 says, And the rest were killed with a sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Going back to Jesus' words uh, specifically in Matthew 25, uh, another central passage regarding this time, uh, in verse 31, he describes what it's like. He says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he's referring to the second coming at the end of the tribulation, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And this is speaking of him ruling and reigning for a thousand years. We call it the millennium. Uh, but he will have to judge people as to whether they're allowed into his kingdom. He says in verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. A funny story, when I was at Dallas Seminary, we went to uh, the State Fair of Texas every year uh, and we had just gone through a barn of uh, livestock and as we were coming out, a lady asked me, uh, do you know uh, where the sheep are? And I say, well, they're right in their building I just came out of. And as she was walking in, my wife nudged me and said, those weren't sheep, those were goats. <laughs> you can tell I grew up in the suburbs of Southern California. I'm not very uh, aware of livestock. Uh, well, in my defense, uh, these particular goats uh, had long hair or wool or something like that. Uh, they looked more fuzzy than the, the ordinary goats I, I think I could recognize out of the storybooks. Jesus is going to have no trouble judging between those who are saved and those who are unsaved. The sheep are the saved, the goats are the unsaved. And this is going to end up in everlasting punishment. They'll be cast into outer darkness. But Matthew 25, 34, the king says to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. When God created us and placed us here on earth, it was his intention uh, that man, being created in his image, would rule this earth as a mediator for God. So it would be God's rule through man here on this perfect earth that he created. But as you know, man rebelled, 
Uh, man disappointed God. Uh, man fell into a state of sin uh, that brought about uh, his death. And all of us being born as children of Adam, of inherited nature, and have inherited uh, the imminent death that we have. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, is going to fulfill what the original intention was. Adam was supposed to rule over the earth as a mediator for God. Jesus Christ, as the second Adam, is going to do as a real human being, God in the second person, joining with us, adding to his deity humanity, becoming a real human being, living perfectly. He will be the perfect human ruler, the God-man ruler, for a thousand years here on this earth. And the earth will be much like it was back in the Garden of Eden. It will be a delightful place. And believe it or not, the reward for us as Church Age Saints is that we are offered the opportunity to rule and reign with Him. We talked during the Judgment Seat of Christ period in which we were saying our capacity for appreciating what Jesus is doing in our lives, our capacity for enjoying Him, our capacity for enjoying the service of ruling and reigning with him here on earth will be measured by how well we've served him during this life right now. And so, if you want Jesus to say to you, come, you are blessed in my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world, we need to serve him in such a way uh, that we are pleasing to him, and we show ourselves responsible and faithful stewards, in which he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into your rest, and we can be a part of that reign here on earth. After the thousand-year reign, uh, the Old Testament and tribulation saints uh, who have died will be raised at that time to inherit the kingdom. Revelation 20, verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and have not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. What a beautiful promise. So much to look forward to. I think during this time of 2020, we have had such events of biblical proportions uh, that we sense uh, that the Lord is preparing us uh, for end time events. And that's what makes this so interesting to us is because we say, refresh my memory as to what I'm looking for and how I would recognize these coming events and what should I be about as I wait. Some of the Thessalonians were so excited about the imminent return of Christ as they just quit their jobs and stood on a hill and waited for Christ to return. And the words from the Apostle Paul were, if, uh, if they don't want to work, don't let them eat. Don't help them in this. They should be about the Lord's business. And that's what we should be about. We shouldn't just uh, twiddle our thumbs and say, uh, well, uh, if he comes, he comes. If he doesn't, he doesn't. Uh, it doesn't make any difference to me. We are to be about the Lord's business and serving him with all our hearts. Because there is a huge divide in eternity. There are those who come to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. There's also those, these unbelieving, Matthew 25, 46, who will go away into eternal conscious punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Those are the destinies. Those are huge differences of destinies. And we need to make this clear uh, to our friends, to our neighbors, to people we meet. And frankly, because of 2020, people are a lot more interested in talking to us. They're a lot more interested in trying to understand the signs of the times and what this is all about. And we have a wonderful opportunity to talk about the difference in destinies and how that is evaluated. Not one of us can save ourselves. Not one of us could have eternal life because we have performed so well. And this is a huge misunderstanding. People think if I'm good, if I'm really good, 
God will accept me. But the actual truth of it is not one of us can be perfect enough for God to accept us the way we are. We need to be forgiven. We need a substitute. We need someone else to take our penalty for us. And that happened in the person of Jesus Christ. God in the first person, the Father, asked God in the second person, the Son, to be willing to become one of us, to add to his deity humanity, to be 100% God and 100% man at the same time, the God-man. He came humbly. It required the veiling of his glory. It required the humbling of himself. And if you watch how humble his life was, it teaches us huge lessons about humility. He lived perfectly. He committed no sin. He was born without sin, never sinned, did not need to die for himself. But as he told us the truth about eternal destinies, though he came unto his own, his own received him not. And consequently, he began to announce that he'd have to come again. Israel cried out, crucify him. And the Romans crucified him. And Satan may have thought that he had won, thought that he destroyed salvation's plan. But God the Father, in his infinite wisdom, took the opportunity of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ to pour out his wrath that he held towards us because of our sins. And instead of pouring them out on us, he poured them out on his Son. So he who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so he took our penalty. He paid the debt that we could not pay. And it made it possible for God then to forgive us if we would humble ourselves and call out to him. What is the requirement? To be perfect in our obedience? Not one of us could achieve that. The requirement is believe. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be saved. That means we have to stop trusting in ourselves, trusting in our own ability, trusting in anything that we could do to save ourselves, and instead say, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you are my God, my Savior. I believe that you died to pay for my sins. I want you to forgive me of my sins. And he promises the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. And God, through his Spirit, will draw us to himself and he will enable us to believe. And that's how we receive the forgiveness of our sins. And as we serve him with all of our being, with all of our hearts, with all of our might, as we serve him for his glory, he rewards us by giving us a place in his kingdom and then eventually living with him forever in a new created earth. and We will rule and reign with him forever and ever and ever. Brothers and sisters, though these are scary times and these prophecies are scary, some will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And that is our promise. If we believe in Jesus Christ, we can be saved. Will you pray with me? Father, we come before you and we ask that we would understand your word and take it at your word. In faith, believe in you. Stop trusting in ourselves and instead trust in you. Father, forgive our sins and give us eternal life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you trust him and serve him. See you soon.